Good morning. There we go. Sorry. The uh, the older you get, and I'm sure hopefully everyone feels this way too, the less you just want to deal with technology. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So this will deal. This will be good for our PowerPoint. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, this this morning we're here to talk about call for sub regional share recommendations. Um, so this is the last call for projects to program a draft. Uh, a new tip covering 24 to 27, and the last call for projects um, out of four to really look at funding that was newly allocated to Dr. Cog from FY22 all the way out to 27. Um, so first two calls for projects really dealt with the existing tip, um, covered um, a regional call and a sub-regional call. Those funds have been programmed. Sponsors are actively working um, in their IGA process with either CDOT or RTD. Um, for any projects selected under call three and call four, those projects will be placed into a new TIP, again, 24 to 27 that Dr. Tag is developing. We'll bring that back to you in August uh, for a recommendation. So a little bit more detail about call four itself. It was open from late November until late January. Um, there was two tracks, essentially sponsors had the ability to submit within either one of these tracks. Um, the first was air quality multimodal, essentially any project that's looking to uh, improve air quality or reduce congestion. And of course, there's the FTBG, your surface transportation block grant, that is an individual federal funding source. Um, they could also submit any projects within that track. The individual applications were submitted to each individual forum. Um, the technical committees or the forums themselves went through a scoring process. Um, they went through a deliberation process and also recommended based on a funding target uh, within each one of those tracks. For those projects that were not funded, uh, projects were placed on a wait list. Um, just to step back and look at all four of these calls, um, this was Obviously, for those who have been hearing us um, talk about this for the last year and a half, very unique. It's quite different than what we would normally do in a normal tip cycle where there might be just two calls for projects. So taking a look at kind of the effect of all four of these projects, um, it might be slightly interesting and or confusing to look at what is submitted within call four uh, and simply look at that kind of as a standalone call for projects. Um, most of these project sponsors that have received funds in this call, we're probably looking back at those three previous calls. So again, might be easier to look at all four calls rather than to sort of pick and choose and look at the individual projects just select from this call. But in this table, we uh, summarize the submittals the, in, in the recommendations, whether they were recommended for funding or those projects that were placed on the wait list. Um, if you're trying to do some quick math, it might not all work um, just because some of those individual projects that were recommended for funding might only be partially funded and the remaining portions of those projects might be placed on the actual wait list. Um, there was also a public comment process relatively new for these calls for projects. Actually, we started this with the 20 to 23 tip cycle. Um, we're really looking at soliciting public feedback before each individual forum and before each one of the MPO process committees are really looking to take action on those projects. So that two week comment period for this call was in early February from the 1st to the 22nd. Um, those who wish to make comments could do so directly on a web map. 
or the traditional ways of email or phone. Um, there was a, a e-blast that Dr. Cox staff um, sent out um, containing all this information beyond just um, the Dr. Cog website and our social media posting. On that web map, web map, if they chose to provide a comment, they could indicate support, concern, or an opposition to that in, individual submittal. They were also had the ability to add uh, written comments. Almost 1,100 comments were received within that uh, approximate 20-day period. Um, and again, like I said, those individual forums were able to use those comments in their deliberations and their recommendation process. So before we get into a motion, just want to sort of outline what is coming up within the next uh, couple months. Um, of course, tomorrow night we will take this to the board for action. Um, once that does happen, these call for recommend recommendations will be placed into the draft document, so you will see them again. Um, approximately a month um, for a 30-day period. We'll have a public comment period on that draft TIF um, that will conclude July 19th at the board meeting for, with a public hearing. And then we will bring that right back for the recommendation and action on that entire draft, uh, starting with the July TAC and then coming back to, to this committee and the board in August. At those two meetings, that public hearing and then at your meeting in August, we will bring back to you sort of a high-level summary of not only looking at calls three and four, so for those projects that went into this draft tip that you'll be taking action on, but also looking at a high level summary of all four of those calls. So everyone can get a, a basic understanding and idea of what this $455 million in Dr. Cog allocations is really gonna provide over the coming years. So with that, happy to take any questions or comments you may have, but the proposed motion on your screen um, move to recommend to the Board of Directors the sub-regional share projects to be included in the draft 24 to 27 tip.
technology. No. Yeah. <laughs> I could not function without them. Well, well, I'll explain that. Up. I actually don't have a presentation. You hear me at this point? So, uh, I think I'm just about it. We've been talking a lot about it. And we have a Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Shaw. That's a good question. So, and we kind of debated in how to structure this amendment. We wanted to be specific enough for our federal partners to be clear of some of the major grants that we might be interested in. And we've talked around, we've talked about some of those around this table, uh, safe streets and roads for all, the SMART grants, some of those others. Uh, but we also put in the language that it's not just two or three. It's, those are examples of kind of a larger concept of grants for which we are eligible, federal grants for which we are eligible under the bipartisan infrastructure law. So it's not just those. Thank you for that. Okay. Yes, we do need, this is an action, we do need an action. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as the chair mentioned, my name is Josh Schwank. I'm a planner here at Dr. Cog with our uh, project delivery and programming team here today to discuss our environmental justice and equity project, which is an ongoing project uh, that we've been doing between our divisions. Uh, to try to improve some of our uh, equity analyses across some of our programs. So just an outline of what I'll discuss today. Uh, I'll go over um, our timeline of uh, how we've been putting this together, uh, some of the deliverables that we've produced uh, out of this project so far, and some of our next steps of what we hope to accomplish in the future. So just as a reminder, uh, here on your screen, these are a few examples of some of the programs that we have that do include uh, equity analyses. So our Title VI Implementation Plan 
is really that plan that uh, provides the foundational equity uh, work for our agency uh, and ensures compliance with our federal equity requirements. And then, of course, within our regional transportation plan, we evaluate those projects for their equity impact, as well as within our transportation improvement program. So those analyses uh, look a little bit like this um, at the moment. Uh, so we have identified geographic areas, uh, environmental justice areas, and then usually compare investment locations uh, to those areas. So you can see that across all three of these documents here. So what we wanted to accomplish with this project was uh, looking at ways to make these analyses more meaningful, um, provide a little bit more information as part of those analyses, uh, evolve our engagement strategies with the public and with all of you, uh, especially looking at how we can increase input from those that traditionally have not uh, been part of our transportation planning processes. Um, look at how we might uh, use these analyses as part of future funding decisions, um, and then tie all of our equity approaches across our various programs together so that we had a unified approach. So uh, this is just a timeline of the project so far. So we did begin last summer, and we began with uh, some initial research looking at uh, what some of our peers were doing around the country, as well as what the literature recommended. Um, that moved into some improvements to our data sets. So we made some uh, data improvements to our environmental justice zones data set and uh, included some new indicators within our new marginalized communities data set. Um, phase three, we created the agency's first equity index, and I'll get more into what that is in a second, um, as well as uh, really figuring out how we can evaluate benefits burdens a little bit better. Um, so what those impacts of those projects might be on neighboring communities. Um, phase four is where we are right now. So that is piloting this approach with the, excuse me, with the environmental justice analysis as part of the transportation improvement program. And then in the future, we will adapt this analysis uh, for use with the regional transportation plan as well. So in the past, we had what we called our vulnerable populations data set, um, and you can see those indicators here on your screen. Um, so our new marginalized communities data set that is used in the equity index uh, actually includes 10 indicators, so it's been slightly expanded. Um, those that are highlighted in yellow have a definition change uh, just to improve the data quality that is being used in those, and those that are in orange are new indicators that we've added. Um, housing cost burden was added uh, to fit with the state definition of um, disadvantaged or excuse me disproportionately impacted communities, um, and the other two were added based on feedback that we saw from our peer agencies and from uh, the engagement that we did. We've also uh, revised the environmental justice zone data set uh, just with a definition change on that low income indicator. So in some of the research that we did, we looked at uh, several indices, equity indices that exist. Um, we looked at the Colorado Envirus screen here at the state level, as well as several federal indices um, that are used by various uh, agencies. We also wanted to do one-on-one -on -one peer interviews with several peer MPOs around the country. So we looked at Philadelphia, Corpus Christi, the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, got their, impact, their input on what has worked for them, uh, things they would change if they were creating an index again from scratch. And then our GIS team here uh, piloted a couple different options, ranging from very simple to more complex. Um, and ultimately, what we ended with uh, was what you see here on your screen. So we're calling this the domains method, essentially breaking those 10 indicators into three domains or, or buckets. Uh, based on their primary theme. So within each domain, each of these indicators is weighted equally, um, and then each domain is weighted equally. So each is worth a third of the final index score. Um, and there's some benefits to doing it this way. So we wanted to leave it open to expand this in the future. If we heard through further engagement that we should really be looking at some additional environmental indicators or health indicators, et cetera, we can simply add a new domain in the future to this data set. Um, 
it's significantly easier to explain and understand uh, three domain values rather than the uh, 10 component indicators. And it avoids overemphasizing any one domain. So if we were to take all 10 just as equal, um, you know, those, those five indicators within mobility barriers, each of those five would be weighted equally to each of the two within race and national origin. This avoids any one indicator from overpowering any of the others. So we also wanted to look into the benefits and burdens of transportation projects. Um, so in the past, we've primarily looked at kind of any investment into a community as a benefit, but we wanted to get a little more uh, in depth into what those benefits and burdens might be. We understand every transportation project has the potential to include both benefits and, and burdens. Uh, and both should be taken into account. Um, so in order to do that, we wanted to organize our research. We looked at the five themes and outcomes in MetroVision, as well as the six uh, investment priorities in the Regional Transportation Plan. We also looked at the five um, impacts that are, have been defined by the U.S. Department of Transportation's Justice 40 Equity Program. So those sort of framed our research. We also held two listening sessions with community-based organizations throughout the region. Over 80 were invited. Uh, not all of them participated, obviously, uh, but we did provide both virtual and in-person options to get their feedback to help shape what those might be. And then we also reached out to staff, recognizing that we have a lot of expertise here on hand. Uh, we asked what some of those uh, benefits and burdens might be around uh, some broad uh, project type categories. So. Uh, this is a selection of what we heard from the community-based organization listening sessions. The full uh, list is included within your packet, uh, but this is just a selection that we wanted to pull out to demonstrate what we heard back. Some of these, obviously, we do not have any uh, control over. We cannot institute free or reduced fares across the region as Dr. Cog, but we wanted to share them uh, in interest of transparency on what we heard back from the organizations and the community. Um, we did use what we heard back to adjust uh, some of the benefits and burdens that we were considering, and I'll show that here uh, in a moment. But first, uh, what we heard back from uh, Dr. Cog's staff, um, as I mentioned, we used these broad, uh, four broad project type categories, um, and just asked through a mentee poll exercise uh, what some of the impacts around those projects might be. Um, likelihood that a project could cause certain impacts, how a project might impact certain people, whether those living near a project, those passing through, um, those with particular demographic characteristics. Um, so this is a, a simplified version of what we heard back from staff. Um, as you can see, sort of those areas that are shaded more heavily, uh, those are areas where there might be more likelihood of a benefit or a burden. At the regional level, we cannot evaluate every single individual project. We recognize that's something individual sponsors are looking at through NEPA. Um, we are just looking at the likelihood at the project type level that there could be a benefit or could be a burden, and that's something that the project sponsor should take into account as they're uh, designing their project in order to mitigate that. Um, so here you see our draft list of benefits and burdens. I do want to note everything that is bolded on this screen uh, was added based on feedback that we heard uh, through engagement. Um, so we did go back and adjust some of these uh, to better reflect what we are hearing from the community. We wanted to frame this uh, based on what we heard from USDOT, uh, that every, essentially every benefit has a uh, equal burden um, and that a project could do either. So just some very high level uh, conclusions that we came to, we heard that there was about a proportional likelihood that a that roadway project could cause benefits or burdens. And then for transit, active transportation and safety or operational type projects, we heard in general, there is probably a likelihood that they would provide more benefits than burdens. But with all of these, as you saw on that staff exercise slide, there could be the potential for both. And we want to take those into account and we want to highlight 
um, the most likely benefits and burdens associated with each. So some limitations, because of course there are quite a few. Um, what we have developed so far has been developed primarily for the transportation improvement program, that final environmental justice analysis at the end. It will need to be revised for the regional transportation plan. The RTP includes a lot of investments, a lot of very large investments across the region. Um, and so figuring out how best to reflect that when those are spread fairly evenly across the entire region uh, will be something we need to look into. We do want to uh, continue community engagement. Uh, as I said, we were only able to have two listening sessions. We'd like to do a bit more, uh, particularly around benefits and burdens to help to shore that up a bit more in the future. Um, we understand that projects currently in the TIP can be funded by multiple sources and Dr. Cog may provide minority funding for a project with the majority of that funding coming from other agencies. So only looking at Dr. Cog funding may be a limitation. We also recognize there are projects in the TIP that are completely funded either by local agencies, by CDOT or RTD, and those are not included within this analysis. We're only looking at Dr. Cog's investment. Um, we also recognize projects in the TIP may only be for a study or for pre-construction activities. So the benefits and burdens associated with that project essentially are nil um, because that project will not have impacts on communities until there are on the ground improvements. Uh, the way we've approached that is how we've done it in the past. We've looked at what the final outcome of that project will be once it is finally built. Um, and then, as I mentioned, at the regional scale, looking at equity is inherently limited. Um, we're looking at projects across an eight county region um, and looking at very high level project types. So ultimately it is, uh, as always, up to the project sponsor to take those uh, considerations into uh, the design of their project to help to mitigate any impacts that might be there. So next steps, uh, as I mentioned, we are currently uh, testing this approach through the environmental justice analysis for the TIP. Um, we're going to revise it uh, and Next year, we will be passing an update to our Title VI implementation plan as well as our other non-discrimination plans. So we hope to include this approach within those and that will set um, the base level equity analysis for all of our programs across Dr. Cog. Um, as I mentioned, we'll look into how to further incorporate equity into future regional transportation plan and TIP updates, and then look at how we can improve uh, community engagement specifically around our new transportation corridor planning and community-based transportation planning set-aside program. So happy to take any questions you may have, but that is all I have for you today. So to your first question, so this is how we have benefits and burdens framed at the moment. Um, so looking across each of these areas, access, mobility, congestion, environment, health, safety, resilience, and development, recognizing that a project could improve conditions around those areas or uh, deteriorate conditions around those areas. Um, definitely looking at further improving these. Um, as I mentioned, we, we only were able to conduct two listening sessions and we would like to do more engagement around those. Um, focus groups around uh, communities around completed projects are definitely something that would be very interesting. Uh, we haven't uh, established what 
that future engagement might look like yet, um, but that definitely is something that could be uh, very insightful, I think. Um, recognizing, as I mentioned, we're only looking at those broad project categories at kind of the regional level. So incorporating that, um, not necessarily at the individual project level, but always at that, at that regional level. Um, I'm so sorry. Can you repeat your second question? I've completely blanked. <laughs> Um, so we had um, a couple different approaches to that. Um, we actually did have a couple um, meetings, just one-on-one -on -one with staff uh, to get their thoughts, um, and then as well as the mentee survey, um, really looking at uh, by those broad project categories, so roadway, active transportation, transit, and safety and operational, what are the likelihood that they would cause, and then each of those burdens, um, and then breaking that out by um, for people of color, what are the likelihood that it would cause these results? For people biking through this area, what are the likelihood that it would do this? For people using transit through this area, what is the likelihood? Um, so really trying to get at that a couple different ways and then combine those results into a final analysis of, in general, what might be the benefits and burdens that we can expect to be associated with these projects for kind of the broad population around. We do not. Um, we're using uh, U.S. Census American Community Survey data, so it is solely based on whether or not they have a vehicle. We think by combining it with those other indicators that that helps us to get at that a little bit, but that was an indicator that we heard was important, and we did want to continue to include that, but it, it doesn't get whether those are choice or, or by necessity. So um, to your first couple, um, so we think by combining these through the index, that helps to a little bit get at that uh, when you mentioned three or more factors. I think that helps us to kind of see where there might be clusters of folks with all of these or with several of these um, indicators. But yeah, we can definitely look into specifically um, individuals with multiple of those because I think that is important. Um, for older adults, uh, the reason we dropped that, uh, we, we did see 60 plus being used by several of our peers. That's also a threshold used by um, our area agency on aging for several of their programs. So we just wanted to make that uniform across the agency. Um, for people born outside the US, that was something we had seen used by uh, some of our peers. Um, recognizing those folks might uh, navigate the transportation system a little bit differently. Um, so. It could have fit under race and national origin, could have fit under mobility barriers. We have it under race and national origin, but recognizing 
Um, there could be some overlap there with people with limited proficiency, some overlap with people of color, um, but recognizing folks coming from other countries might be expecting particular uh, transportation modes that aren't necessarily the primary modes that we are using here. They might be uh, just navigating differently from how folks uh, born within the US are. So we wanted to include that um, just to see how that data shakes out. And uh, so far, uh, that is something we've chosen to stick with for now. Um, that's not something that we uh, currently have taken into account on the benefits and burdens list. Uh, it's certainly something we could consider in the future. Um, right now, we're really trying to get at more of those kind of direct impacts of the transportation projects, but recognizing there are lots of those spillover effects. Um, so as we continue engagement around uh, shoring these up, definitely that's something we want to hear from all of you, what some of those impacts might be something we want to hear from our communities, what those impacts might be, and how we can better reflect those in this list. I 
page and a multitude of different Do we factor in Sorry, Director. Um, so that is something we want to continue to improve, and that's one of the reasons we want to continue to engage in uh, a lot of engagement with the community is to build those uh, uh, feelings of trust with uh, community-based organizations, show them that there is outcome that's coming from uh, the feedback that they're providing, and hopefully to kind of deepen that to some of those organizations that we weren't able to reach, um, bring those in, and hopefully build those relationships so that we can have some, some deeper engagement in the future. So at the moment, uh, as part of phase four of this, we are looking at that final environmental justice report as part of the transportation improvement program. So that's more of a, at the end of the process, looking back and seeing how we did. Um, moving forward, we are looking at how we can bring that in earlier in the process. Maybe that is by providing this information to a project review panel as they're looking at, you know, they have project scores, they have public comments, they also have an equity outcome. Uh, so that's something that they can take into account as exploring while exploring those projects um, or bring that in other ways earlier into the process in the development of these documents. Uh, but at the current phase, it is that final report in the transportation improvement program. I think Ron was. funny decisions in the program. So we gathered
So one first step that we've taken is uh, the equity index data set itself has been added to the Dr. Hogg data tool, and that is out on our regional data catalog. So as applicants to some of our uh, set-aside programs or to other programs that other agencies are hosting throughout the region, they can access that data tool and they can see uh, specific demographic information around their project site. So that's kind of a first step that we're taking, uh, but definitely we want to uh, continue to explore that and certainly work in benefits burdens earlier in the process as well as you, uh, you've outlined. Uh, I don't recall the exact number, Byron, do you? Definitely noted, and we are trying to make strides in making our engagement more accessible. Um, definitely trying to work on uh, having uh, language access, having um, access for those with uh, disabilities, having access for those that might have children, might have lack of daycare, things like that. So looking into uh, strategies that we can use to help to make all of our programs a bit more accessible. Um, so that's definitely an area that we need to grow in. Yeah. Thank you. 
there's really nothing you can do more about the story than not a Well, and that is something we're trying to get at with that. That bottom line increase the risk of displacement. That's not just residential displacement, but also potential business displacement, things like that. So as new projects come in, as neighborhoods change, what are the likely outcomes of that?
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have the easy job here to introduce our presenter. But as you all know, uh, CDOT's bus staying service has been growing rapidly over the years, both in its geographic coverage as well as the types of services that uh, bus staying is offering. So we thought it'd be time for, it was very timely for an update on the bus staying program. So go ahead and come on up. And I want to introduce Ben Gelman uh, from CDOT's Division of Transit and Rail, who's the bus staying program manager, to give you an update. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, ben Gelman here uh, with CDOT's Division of Transit and Rail, uh, representing our bus operations uh, branch. As you can tell, I'm not Jennifer Phillips. Uh, she is uh, she is unfortunately uh, out today with an illness, so I'm just kind of uh, slotting in in her set. Um, but happy to be here and talk about the, the Bustang Family of Services. Um, so yeah, so the Bustang Family of Services, uh, it's composed of several different routes and lines. Uh, so the most most visible one, of course, is our, our purple uh, Bustang fleet. Uh, that's our interregional express program, and that uh, consists of our north, south, and west lines uh, operating on I-25 and I-70. Uh, we've also got our rural focus. Uh, We've also got there we go. We've also got our uh, Mustang Outrider program, which is uh, our rural focus program uh, operating throughout the state. Uh, last Labor Day or sorry, last uh, Memorial Day weekend, we had the pleasure of launching the Howard Pegasus uh, service using uh, smaller transit vans that actually can uh, operate in those I-70 Mountain Express lanes. Uh, between Denver and the town of Avon, with uh, the regular stops in between there. Uh, and then we have also some seasonal services. So our, our Bus Bank Broncos uh, program, our Snow Bank service, which just ended uh, the week before last, and our upcoming uh, Bus Bank to uh summer seasonal service, uh, serving town of Estes Park as well as going directly into uh, Rocky Mountain National Park. So just an update here first on our primary uh, bus staying system. Uh, we are seeing, you know, continued recovery from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for the, the year ending uh, December 31st, we actually carried 175,000 passengers in our north, south, and west one, uh, which represents a 92% growth year over year uh, from calendar year 2021. Um, just a quick note on these uh, next couple slides here. Um, some of you all might be aware uh, the state fiscal year runs July 1 and June 30. Uh, so the starts here might be a little off here. Uh, but yeah, we are seeing, like I said, uh, nice improved ridership. Uh, we actually are now seeing uh, overall growth uh, from a 2019 baseline for our uh, bus line left line. Uh, I think. For the year ending December 31st, we actually saw about a 20% increase over those 2019 figures for the bus line. Um, similar, you know, positive story here with uh, bus lane outrider. Uh, for the year ending December 31st, uh, the bus lane outrider system carried about 35,000 uh, passengers with rural. Uh, regional centers as well as our more urban centers such as Denver, uh, Grand Junction, Pueblo. Um, we were able to launch uh, in the past several months uh, two additional busing operator routes. One is uh, our Munston, or sorry, our Sterling to Greeley and Sterling to Denver route, operated by the Northeastern, uh, Northeastern Colorado Association of Local Governments, NECAL. Uh, operating three days a week from Sterling to Greeley and two days a week from Denver. Uh, that launched in November 2022. Um, and we are now looking at extending that service uh, to directly to Denver International Airport. Uh, we currently stop at the RTD uh, Peoria station. Uh, so we're 
a little bit of an easier connection for folks coming from um, northeastern Colorado. Uh, in March 2023, we also launched our Turning Up to Pueblo route. Um, we are pretty excited about that one. It's our first route in the Outrider system that actually operates with multiple round trips a day. Uh, so we've seen good uptake on that, and sort of as a promotional uh, measure to get that route off the ground, we launched with uh, Air Free, which has been extended through uh, the end of this month. Uh, so just you know, so we do have, uh, I believe it's eight routes now in the Mustang Outrider system. Um, going the overall uh, route performance here. Um, doing fairly well. Uh, as you can see, the, the pink line is uh, 2022, with the purple line being 2021. So with very few exceptions, you know, all of our routes here are just the every year going. We are, our busting outrider system is kind of led uh, by our two routes serving Crested Butte from Denver, uh, with service also to Salida, and our correct to Denver routes with service to the Springs and uh, Winter Park. Um, so you can see the y-axis here are a little higher than these, so these can do really well. We're actually looking at adding a second route, uh, oh, sorry, a second round trip daily. Um, we are still, you know, getting that sterling to Greeley and Denver route off the ground. So, uh, unfortunately, a little lower ridership there. Uh, to get up off the ground, especially. Um, in terms of our Pegasus program, um, as I mentioned earlier, that launched last year around this time on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we have seen, you know, steady, uh, especially since November, consistent growth month over month. Uh, on that Pegasus program, uh, including, or this has been helped by you know, expanding to a daily service uh, in September after Labor Day weekend. Um, we did put in place the schedule modifications uh, just after President's Day weekend um, that has helped us with driver recruitment and with reducing uh, overall cost of the program related to overnight hotel stays for those drivers. And, you know, ending. Through March 31st, we've carried now um, nearly 16,000 passengers, uh, averaging 5% of the build in that first quarter in June. So now going through our seasonal services uh, for Busting to Broncos, you know, we do work in partnership with the Denver Broncos uh, to operate intercity service uh, primarily along the north line uh, from Fort Collins and the south line from Colorado Springs. Uh, we carried almost 2,000 passengers over the 10 or 11 home games last year, including three. Um, while the Broncos season you know, left a bit to be desired, uh, for those of us here who are fans, uh, we were pretty happy with, uh, with our, our ridership and with helping uh, give folks you know, more options to get to the game. Uh, Options to you know avoid that traffic, the traffic and parking hassle. Um, and for twenty five dollars round trip, uh, it's really competitive with the price of parking. And again, certainly helps. Um, we did also uh, attempt a, a pilot on the bus line, um, going as far as uh, Vail, uh, town of Vail. Did see really weak ridership on this pilot though. Um, only five total passengers um, on that first home game that we offered service for. Um, so several of those trips could end up uh, not operating on schedule. Uh, lack of reservations beforehand. Um, we did up our marketing as well, though. Um, so we reached over 385,000 people total, uh, driving nearly 6,000 uh, total social media advertising on and, uh, um, So Snow Thing, um, Snow Thing launched on December 17th last year, and our last run was uh, the first weekend of um, We 
served five resorts this year from Metro Denver. Uh, the wood stops uh, at Denver Union Station, uh, RTD's Lakewood Federal Center Station, and the uh, Woolly Mammoth Park and Ride. Uh, you'll see that lot near 170, um, which helps drive ridership as well. Um, through the end of April, uh, we carried 7,700 uh, passengers up and down the mountain, which is about 75% year over year growth. Um, so, you know, we're really excited to see uh, our continual improvement from the COVID pandemic. We uh, did operate a full season um, for the 2021 ski season, but still seeing some impact from COVID pandemic there. Um, so we served five resorts this year. Um, so our four resorts returned from the previous season. So that would be a Steamboat Resort, uh, Arapahoe Basin, Copper Mountain, um, <laughs> thank you, Loveland. Um, and we had the pleasure this year of adding uh, Breckenridge in partnership out of Breckenridge and with uh, Breckenridge Resort uh, going directly into that Breckenridge main dot rotation that comes down for us and into. Um, so again, uh, through additional allocations from Senate Bill 180 uh, past the 2022 session, um, Ridership and low percentage perk. As you can see, January and February were definitely our, our strongest month. Um, we did see a trail off a bit uh, in March and April. Um, so we're looking into ways that we can that sort of later season uh, performance, but we're overall very happy with how it's been booked up, up to the mountain. And you know, while not part of the, the snow thing service, uh, you know, within CDOT uh, CTR, we are really proud of our effort this year to give back to the community uh, with partnering with our slide, with Slide Through Saturday, uh, which is a partnership between uh, Ski Noir, H280 Club, um, I-70 thing, uh, for those of y'all who are on Instagram a lot, <laughs> um, as well as Red Bull USA. Um, CDOT's contribution to this was uh, in kind uh, transportation. Uh, um, the main goal of this program was to diversify the mountain. Um, of course, the uh, ski and snowboarding industry is overwhelmingly white. Um, and so we saw this as an opportunity to help out a program that was already in existence um, with bringing more people of color and giving people additional opportunities uh, that they uh, wouldn't have otherwise had. I think there's a lot of there were a lot of folks on these trips. I think we did about five trips this year, one a month. Um, there were folks that you know, were in their 30s and 40s, um, lifelong Denver residents, um, who had the opportunity for the first time to partnership to uh, go off and experience. Um, yeah. uh, and then last on our uh, seasonal services. This will be a little different than the, the printed packets that y'all have, um, but our busing to exit service will be launching Memorial Day weekend um, and operating through uh, October 1st this year uh, with select uh, holiday Monday service as well. Um, you know, we're really happy with this partnership with the Town of Estes Park and with uh, Rocky Mountain National Park uh, to uh, operate you know, weekend service going directly into Rocky Mountain National Park, um, as well as, you know, service to Town of Estes Park Visitor Center, uh, which offers, you know, strong connections to local transit. Um, so, again, with that enhanced marketing, uh, with adding a stop this season uh, at the US 36 in Broomfield RTD Park and Ride, um, and with, you know, some additional fare discounts this year. Um, 
Southern 2 through 12, that'll be a $5 round trip ticket, uh, making it easier for folks with, uh, with small ones to, you know, get experience in National Park. Um, and this year, for the first time, we're also operating student discount um, of 25% uh, to stop in both in Denver and at uh, RTD's Boulder Little Mesa Station. So we saw an opportunity there to try to reach out to folks who um, may not have cars either by choice or uh, by need and give them uh, an opportunity to follow this beautiful suburb. So just wrapping up here, uh, looking ahead, we do have several planning efforts underway within the Division of Transit and Rail. Um, we are hoping to wrap up uh, in the next month or two uh, our bus and expansion study. Um, I mentioned earlier that additional funding that uh, the bus staying program was granted through Senate Bill 180, um, which most of you all probably know better for the Deer Affair uh, funding for ozone season. Um, but we're working now to wrap up that expansion survey, or sorry, that expansion study uh, to see how best to allocate those additional funds to increase the frequency of service along our four routes, um, our I-25 and our I-70 service. Um, our 5311F uh, study outrider funding uh, will be included, and apologies for the typo here, uh, in the May uh, NOFA. Um, so that will be open to uh, the state of Colorado to, to uh, for those, offer, those outrider routes. Um, we're also exploring and performance measures and uh, data reporting, um, including to get uh, a data dashboard up off the ground to make that uh, data more accessible to the members of the public and to decision makers. We are also working with uh, the Office of Innovative on the Connected Colorado project. Um, it's similar in ways to RTD's ongoing uh, AIM grant project, uh, but the goal of this Connected Colorado program uh, will be to provide sort of a one-tap uh, trip planning, as well as a one-tap uh, fare payment, mobile fare payment uh, service for folks coming into Colorado. I think the, the pitch basically is that uh, someone flying into different ports um, would be able to plan a trip uh, and pay one time their fare to get all the way from DIA out to uh, RTD and with Colorado. Uh, Department of Transportation, local types as well. Um, we are also expecting a bus electrification study. Um, as y'all can probably imagine, uh, given the the distance and the terrain that our services operate on, uh, it's been a little more difficult for us to envision what electrification will look like for our system. Uh, but we know that, especially through the governor's goal, um, uh, fleet electrification that includes bus pay. Uh, so we are working now to see how we can get that moving forward, um, probably on our north and south lines on the I-25 corridor, of course, and then uh, forward to our uh, left. Lastly, we are getting an update for our intercity regional bus survey. I believe that was last updated in 2019. Um, and so that will be, uh, that'll include not just the, the core bus end route, but also uh, trying to explore uh, rural connections, those that exist but uh, could be performing better, or areas where uh, there is existing demand uh, that we're not yet seeing. Ways to expand the operator service as well. And through uh, uh, we're also lastly looking to, or we've placed orders for new vehicles for the bus bank fleet and are exploring uh, funding for uh, a much larger acquisition of new vehicles. Um, our bus bank fleet is aging currently. We do have uh, a lot of units that went online in the system on first launch uh, in 20. Uh, and you know those buses are pushing up against 400, 500,000 miles, uh, getting really close to the end of life there. 
understand what kind of update the fleet as well as provide for the expansion. Um, currently, our biggest challenge with uh, expanding the frequency of our occurrences is you know, that rolling stop. Uh, we need more buses. Um, and we're working to kind of build that whole thing in the expansion plan. And so, with that, um, I'll take it. And uh, that's the question. Yeah, so I, I believe that we've worked in the past with uh, some of the, the TMAs in the South Metro region, uh, the Denver South TMA, uh, to market especially our, our routes serving DTC. Um, in terms of marketing uh, the, ability, the availability of the service trucks living in the South Metro, um, that is, of course, something that we're always working with our marketing partners to sort of expand our reach uh, throughout uh, the metro region, as well as you know, throughout the state. Uh, but yeah, that is. I do, right now we are primarily focused from, from a marketing standpoint. A lot of our marketing is done uh, via social media, um, sort of just to uh, the cost effectiveness of marketing that way. Um, looking at Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah our, our biggest challenges right now are the challenge of our more buses above our current uh, reliably, um, uh, as well as you know, giving them um, making sure that we have parking facilities. Um, I think I have to hear you on part part as well, but I think uh, we'll do a quick look at ways, um, especially for ground check. Thank 
recognizing that, you know, I think that's one of the things that's exciting about in the scenic byway. So all these journeys across the world.
sure. Um, very nice. <laughs> Sure. Um, at this point, I, I'm not aware that folks uh, are starting to on it. I think you're not.
<laughs> I got to I got to prove it. So let's talk about transit from a different perspective, which is um, bus rapid transit or regional bus rapid transit network within the greater Denver, Denver and Dr. Cog region. So just a little bit of background here. Um, I think most of you remember, and many of you were involved with um, RTD's Northwest Area Mobility Study and regional BRT study from a few years ago. Um, there were some other studies as well. We brought that work forward into the original version of the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan that we adopted back in April of 2021. Um, you will recall from my numerous presentations last year that we spent a lot of last year updating and revising the 2050 RTV to respond to uh, what at the time was the new state uh, greenhouse gas transportation planning standard. Um, as part of that work, we advanced the implementation timeframe. I'll show you this in a moment of several of the bus rapid transit corridors that are part of the overall network that's in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. And, you know, it's obviously that is a partnership and the theme of this presentation is partnership, but it's not just within the 2050 RTP. Um, this regional BRT network, portions of it is applicable are in uh, CDOT's uh, statewide plan. Uh, they're in, for example, City of Denver, Denver Moves Everyone plan that they've been working on, other applicable plans as well. So specifically, this is the network that we're talking about. This is a network that we've committed to as a region together, once again, in partnership through our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, both to meet our federal sort of uh, requirements around metropolitan transportation planning, our air quality conformity. As I mentioned, the greenhouse gas transportation planning standard, we have committed to this implementation schedule for these 11 BRT corridors within the greater Denver region, Dr. Cog region, by 2050. As you see, five of them we have committed as a region to implement by 2030, a very assertive time frame. Another five by 2040, and then the last one by 2050. Um, the costs here, just to be clear, are costs. Are, these are planning level, long range planning level cost estimates. Uh, some of them come from the regional BRT study. These are the costs as shown in our 2050 RTP. Again, these are long range kind of planning overall costs. These are not project specific costs. Project specific costs will change as these projects evolve and, and get implemented over time. But even from these, you know, just general cost figures and this time frame, you can see sort of the assertiveness of this, just the significance and the magnitude of this investment in BRT in this region over the next several years. So in terms of this regional BRT partnership, um, several agencies, including most of the agencies in this room, Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, City of Denver, City of Aurora, um, FTA, um, have been starting to work together to stand up a regional BRT partnership. How can we get this done together? Um, how can we work together to actually make this happen on this very assertive um, kind of schedule? So there are some foundational principles that we're starting to work on in this sort of embryonic partnership. A big one is that, as you can see just from this, there is more work, especially by 2030, than any single agency could need or do alone. We all need to work together, again, in partnership. It's going to take multiple agencies, multiple people, multiple uh, funding sources, um, just multiple resources coming together to implement this work over time. Um, the regional BRT partnership, we want to collaborate and assist the multiple BRT corridors simultaneously. There's a lot happening on individual corridors, so we want to coordinate that. We want to integrate that work together. Um, some initial focus, um, again, there is a lot happening on several of these corridors. Um, some acronyms here, but several of these corridors are going through the federal project development process. So AA is Alternative Analysis, NEBA, of course, National Environmental Policy Act, the steps that you have to go through, particularly if you're receiving federal funding um, to implement some of this work. Um, I think you all know that East Colfax um, in Denver and Aurora is, is soon to be under construction. That project has been going on for some time. Uh, CDOT is taking the lead on federal. Um, some of these other corridors are getting started, State Highway 119. Um, up in the Northwest, you all have been working on for years. So there's a lot happening in these corridors already. And we're starting to think ahead uh, to some, you know, the next tranche of some of these corridors. Um, as you'll hear from my colleague, Nora, in the very next agenda item, uh, we're starting an initial corridor study, a planning study um, on Alameda. And there's some other work uh, that is going on or will be going on on some of the other corridors as well. So that's a lot of words. Some people like words, some people like pictures. So we wanted to just try and illustrate sort of graphically what this partnership would look like. And the idea is, once again, sort of that central hub of the regional BRT partnership 
of all of the applicable agencies and stakeholders starting to come together, forming this partnership to coordinate this work and integrate this work across the region. And then we've color-coded the individual bus rapid transit corridors so you can kind of see what's happening with each of those. The ones in orange are being led by CDOT um, and their partners, and we show kind of the sort of time frame um, associated with those. Um, the ones in purple are kind of Dr. Cog led. Um, the one in blue is East Colfax at Denver and, and its partners are leading. And when I say leading, by the way, the idea here, and I want to be clear about this, is that, again, more work than any single agency can do. We all need to come together to help in terms of uh, being stewards and shepherding the planning process, the project development process. So it doesn't mean, for example, that the lead agency is necessarily going to do all these things by themselves. Each of these is a partnership among all the applicable stakeholders and all the applicable agencies. But an agency needs to step up to kind of lead that planning, planning process, to bring the stakeholders together, to shepherd the work through the planning and project development process. And that's what's kind of being reflected here in terms of this intern. So in terms of this partnership that we're just forming with all of these agencies, uh, we're doing some initial sort of organizational work, our monthly meetings, some of the program management, partnership charter things that we need to do as a partnership uh, to literally get the partnership itself, the partners off the ground. But we're also really thinking about planning related issues and project implementation associated with the different corridors. Um, you know, given the aggressiveness, the assertiveness of this time frame, we want to look for efficiencies, synergies across corridors, whether that's operations, whether it's going through the NEPA process, whether it's things like uh, branding or fare payment or station design, or I could rattle off 20 other things. Yes, each corridor is unique, and we want to respect the uniqueness of each corridor, but there are many common elements and threads across the corridors, particularly in this region's ability to implement the corridors together. Can we do some things where we find some efficiencies in the NEPA process, where we do some things together in parallel instead of still piping individual kind of, you know, individual processes for each corridor? That's part of what the partnership wants to do is kind of help leverage those resources, find those efficiencies, um, create that structure and that framework across corridors over time. So that was really quick, but I just wanted to present that highlight. There's going to be a lot more to come. Um, I want to thank the partners, particularly CDOT, um, um, Angie and her shop at Region 1, um, the municipalities, FTA, we've, we've talked with, they're starting to get involved as well. Um, so just wanted to share this with you and happy to answer any, like, any questions on this effort.
Yeah, thank you, Director. That's a good question. So um, let's start with Colfax because that's the furthest along. Uh, we'll be dedicated lanes, as you probably know, and they've been planning that for a very long time and really being intentional about the cross section, the operations, the user experience, what that looks like, right? Some of these other projects, and let me come back to this slide here. Um, these 11 corridors span the spectrum between ones that, like East Colfax, uh, BRT, and Denver and Aurora, they're almost under construction to some of these others that right now are pretty conceptual. So one of the things that we're thinking about, even as a partnership, and we started to discuss this, as Brian just noted, you know, station design, operations, user experience, those sorts of things. What does, you know, what does this look like? And we're at least trying to start from the perspective to answer your specific question. Can we do dedicated lanes um, as an initial assumption for each of these and then find out where we can't do that? But at least starting with the assumption that we're going to try to do that, except in places where we can, as opposed to like, well, not sure if we can do it, not sure what that's going to look like. Again, each of these corridors is unique, and I want to honor that uniqueness, but we are trying to have some common themes across these corridors, and we're trying to maximize the investment, right, in these corridors in terms of how they operate. So to be determined, but at least, again, from that assumption, can we start with that idea and try and implement it across the region? All right. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, today I was just giving an update on two of our new uh, planning programs at Factor Cog. Uh, both of these programs, I think we gave an update on them in the fall, but are a little bit farther along, so kind of wanted to bring you up to speed on where we are for the current iteration, but also kind of what we're thinking about looking ahead. Uh, so both of these programs are unique um, in that these are programs where Dr. Cog is actually leading planning efforts, um, of course, in close partnership with some of our local stakeholders. Um, the first of the two is our pilot corridor planning program. So this program is really focused on advancing some of the specific uh, projects and priorities that are identified in the regional transportation plan. Um, so uh, these dates, I should note, we <laughs> it was actually fall 2022 that we started this project, not in the future. Um, but uh, <laughs> so um, you know, we the this like I said, this project this program is really focused on the corridors themselves that are identified in the regional transportation plan. Um, there's quite a number that are bus rapid transit, like Jacob was just talking about, but also transit um, priority corridors, regional vision zero corridors, multimodal um, project corridors. And so in the fall, we developed some guidelines to the, how we would select from among those many projects that are identified in the plan. Um, we developed some kind of four key um, considerations in selecting programs, which you can see there, um, specifically the saving period, the level of regional impact, the planning needs, and then of course local jurisdiction buy-in. So we did have a call for uh, nominations in the fall to kind of solicit uh, interest from um, member jurisdictions and what corridors they wanted to see Dr. Cog kind of help lead planning and, and moving projects along. Um, so we have selected our first two corridors for this project. Um, the first one, like Jacob just mentioned, is the Alameda Avenue corridor. We're, we're really excited to to work closely with Lakewood, Denver, Aurora, CDOT, and RTD on really some, some of the initial thinking about how we might move for BRT and other priorities along this corridor. There hasn't been a lot of regional work, kind of looking um, across the corridor from Wadsworth all the way to the R-line. So, this is kind of a first step corridor, um, just kind of 
getting the process started. If we if we want to have BRT open on the corridor by, you know, 20, 2039, I think, you know, we need to get started now. So um, we're really excited to get started. Um, we will be working with um, FA2, Felder, Kurt, Holt, and Ulvig, um, and Nelson Nygaard on the project. And we expect this one to be kicking off probably within the next month um, and are really excited to get it underway. Um, with both of these, I should note, we will have a, a variety of levels of engagement. We'll kind of have a core group of the other jurisdictions and uh, CDOT and RTD, but we also will have a, a number of other opportunities for folks to get involved and give feedback on the, on the project. Um, the second kind of our pilot corridors is South Boulder Road. It's identified as a transit priority corridor in the regional transportation plan. It'll run from Boulder through Louisville to um, Lafayette. Um, so this one will be working with fair peers. Um, again, it'll be focused on transit, but also looking at some of the multimodal uh, safety and connections that can, can be improved along the corridor. Um, also kicking off hopefully within the next month or so. So our second of the new two programs that you wanted to give an update on is the Community-Based Transportation Planning Program. Uh, this program is similar in that it is a program where Dr. Cog is helping lead some of the, the planning efforts. Um, but this, the focus of this program is really addressing some of the mobility challenges for underserved populations in the region. So we um, also developed some program guidelines for this one in the fall and had a call for letters of nomination. We did allow local governments to kind of define for themselves what populations within their jurisdiction had mobility challenges, were historically underserved. We had some good nominations from four different communities. Um, and we have selected our first two communities for the program. Um, the first is in the city of Edgewater, looking at two schools, which I'll mention in just a second. We're kicking that one off. Um, now we're already underway on that one. And then we'll be doing a second one looking at first last mile connections um, along kind of the northern section of, of Federal Boulevard. And we'll be starting that one in the fall. Um, so Edgewater, like I mentioned, we're already underway. Um, just kind of to give you a brief sense of what type of study it is, we're looking at two elementary schools, challenges families have to get to and from the school, working closely, of course, with the city of Edgewater, um, with the schools themselves, and with the Jetco Public School District. Um, so this one, um, we will be, oh, again, has those logos on there. Um, we actually are in a selection process right now to select the people to work on this one. So we'll be getting underway pretty quickly. Um, the second one, which we're going to be kicking off this fall, um, is looking at Federal Boulevard between 80th um, and 50th and looking really at the first last mile connection. So I think it'll, it'll pair nicely with the BRT work that's happening along the corridor. But Specifically for folks that are transit dependent who may not have as much access to vehicles, how can they kind of get to key destinations, grocery stores, pharmacy, um, transit that they need to. Um, and this project was proposed by the city of Westminster and by a nonprofit growing home. So um, I should have mentioned on both of these, we are excited to be partnering directly with the community based organization, um, paying them for their time, um, having them kind of be a key stakeholder throughout the process. So growing home. Presented this project, they know that there's a grocery store closed in this area, so there's a lot of folks that are having trouble accessing food. So that's kind of a key theme for this project. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where we at, where where we are at for both of the the kind of two programs. I did want to kind of mention briefly that both of these programs are going to be continuing as six set aside. So these were pilots to kind of help us figure out how how this type of program would work, how we would kind of function working in partnership with local governments. Um, the quarter program, we have, um, a, I think, an estimated $3 million for the next four years. We're going to do two cycles um, of funding. The first, um, I should note, we're going to do a little bit kind of different strategy. We're actually going to have kind of an internal process where we prioritize the corridors that are listed in the um, RTP. We'll probably bring those back to you all in August. Uh, oh, sorry, in June, next month. <laughs> Um, to kind of look at uh, the kind of top priorities. We'll be sending out invites for letters of interest to kind of see of those high priority corridors, which ones our local government's interested in, in working with us on. And then we'll, we're hoping to have a final selection in August for this first um, two, two year cycle. And then the community based transportation plan will also uh, have two, two cycles with a total of, of around two and a half million dollars. Um, it's splitting it with another set aside. Um, so the, we're kind of anticipating call for letters of interest at the end of this year. So if you know projects, um, we're definitely looking to kind of get the word out about this program, find um, 
cities, counties that have populations that they'd like to, to look at in a little bit more detail and that we're hoping to collect in the beginning of next year. So with that, I'll take any questions. Um, and then what is going on? I'm going to take the time to find the time. Hi. Hi. Thank you. 
Thank you. 